Hello, it's Chris Schmidt from Rocket Lasso, and it is Christmas in July because today is the day that Maxon announced R21, the new version of Cinema 4D. This is going to be a video breaking down some of the new features. I'm not going to be able to cover everything, especially not with a scene file, but I'm going to sort of tackle it in the descending order of things I think are really cool, and then there's just a bunch of little things. In fact, uh, this is one of those versions of Cinema 4D where there isn't a couple of core features. It's a little sprinkling of stuff all the way around. Uh, although, having said that, I feel like one of the things that was added is one of the more advanced tools, more potentially complex and controllable and just really interesting and intriguing tools that they've ever added. But why don't we go ahead and pop open Cinema 4D and start going through it. Now, when you open up the new R21, you're going to be introduced to a new screen. First of all, there's a splash screen, but I've already got that closed. But you're going to be introduced to the license manager. And of course, some of the very big news that came out with this version of cinema is that they have changed the way some of the licensing works. There, of course, now is a subscription option. You're not forced into a subscription. You can still get your perpetual license. In fact, the perpetual license is a little bit cheaper than it used to be. But the idea of the new subscription is that it's costing the same amount in fact, I think a little bit less than it used to be to just get the MSA, which was essentially you would pay a certain amount of money and every year you get the next version of cinema as soon as it came out. So that was cool, but they've now broken that down into a subscription where you can get monthly subscriptions, you can get yearly subscriptions. And if you get the regular yearly subscription, then you just pay $59.99 a month, which breaks down to cheaper than the MSA used to be. Or if you want to get the Redshift license as well, then you pay... $81.99. But you can still have your perpetual standalone license just like you used to have before. But I have been using this new workflow for a little bit now, jumping between a laptop and this. And I got to say, I like it. I have no problem with the idea in general subscription models. I use the Adobe one. I don't have really any specific problems. You're always going to be up to date. And that's just good for everyone. And along those lines, with everyone being up to date, they have gotten rid of all of the different flavors of Cinema 4D. There used to be broadcast and standard and studio now there's just the full version there's just cinema 4d that has body paint that has all the character tools it has all the motion graphics tools so one flavor that makes this a lot better for me making tutorials because i know everybody's going to have everything and everything just is working really well you're going to go ahead and when you download cinema 4d it's always the same version so along those lines if you're running the demo it's still the same full version of cinema 4d if you don't have the license it's still the same version if you're running things on a license server if you're running things on your own subscription model or running on the perpetual model, it's all the same thing. So you just have to sign in and it's all account-based. So having done that, why don't I go ahead and sign in? So I skipped over the typing there because I don't want you to see my password. But after that, you're gonna get the anonymous application activity window. And this is going to be sending information to Maxon. They make it really clear that it's strictly, absolutely, completely, and totally anonymous. So you can turn that off in your settings if you want to, but it's on by default, but go ahead and turn it off if you are not comfortable with it. But uh, personally, I trust Maxon with that information. Go ahead and close that. And you're gonna see we have a new quick start dialogue. In the quick start dialogue, you can make a new file, you can open a file, you can go to recent, and you're gonna see whatever feed that Maxon's been curating up here ready to go. And they got a couple of different templates I haven't really tinkered around with, but we are ready to go by closing this, hitting new. Either way, you can go into the preference menu and stop this from popping up at all. Otherwise, it's going to pop up every time you start up Cinema 4D. So let's go ahead and give that a close. And here we are in the brand new interface. So some very important things to point out is that not only do you see this kind of newer, slightly darker layout, but a lot of icons have been moved to new places. And the reason for that is a couple. First of all, like I said, there's no longer different flavors of Cinema 4D. So now, before certain character tools had to be in a character menu because it came with Studio, even though they're better off in a different menu. So everything, in my opinion, has been reorganized in a much more intuitive way. I'm getting tripped up a little bit, but it's actually been incredibly easy to get used to where they've laid out some of the different settings. Like all of the MoGraph tools are inside of a single menu now, both, of, both all of the MoGraph objects and all of the effectors. And now, because fields have become even even more important, they get their own little drop down. Everything is just organized in a slightly better way. I'm, I'm quite pleased with it overall. And it's a tiny thing, but they have moved, they've added in the reset PSR button as a default button, which is amazing. You just use it so often that uh, now I can move my cube somewhere, click that button, and it's going to jump. I tend to find that if, um, if there's a button in the interface that is 
directly clickable. That's quicker to click the button than to do the shortcut. So that being there, I think speeds things up a little bit. And because I'm always making tutorials, I try and leave my layout default. So, you know, I would usually put that button in, but I don't for tutorial purposes. Continuing here with the interface, you'll see that the icons are very crisp and they are a little bit flatter design now. There's not quite as much dimension in them. The layout, of course, has been changed. The Cinema 4D is now going to go up to 4K and it's going to adapt to high resolution monitors. That's just a big positive. I don't think we're really seeing that displayed here. In addition to that, they've redone the viewport in a way where it can now accept file exchanges. And I don't think it's really going to affect too much directly right now, but it's it's called OLE based uh, file exchange. So now you could exchange files between Cinema 4D and Adobe Bridge, for instance, you can drag and drop files from a bridge into this where you couldn't have done that before. So that's another useful little detail on the top. Going along with interface changes, and we're not gonna go over all of them, but there is no longer a plugin dropdown, there is an extension dropdown, and you can see you've got all, you can put all of your plugins in the regular old plugin folder, or create the plugin folder if you need to, but otherwise you can remote link into your plugins just like you could in R20. But I just wanted to mention that these are in this dropdown. The other big important thing to mention is that R21 breaks all the plugins again. It breaks all C++ based plugins, old Python ones should continue to work, I believe. Now, I just wanted to do a really quick shout out on why this happens because uh, it's important to note that it was amazing for a bunch of years that in Cinema 4D, I think from R12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, Plugins didn't break, and that is sort of a miracle. That's really impressive. Almost all pieces of software will break your plugins every single version. Now, what's happening is Maxon has been working on the new core. They've been fundamentally rewriting Cinema 4D from the ground up, and they get all these really cool features. They're having to slowly implement them as we go. And by implementing everything in this new core, it means it breaks plugins. That's a little bit of a pain in the butt right now, but ultimately it means we're getting a better, stronger, more stable Cinema 4D just right now you have to go and update your plugins but i just want to do a shout out to be like well I, I just really appreciate the fact that for so long they didn't break now we're going to be in this rocky period where they're going to be breaking pretty often as the versions come out until it's restabilized with the new fundamental core because the old core was pretty old now before we get into a new features proper the last thing i wanted to mention was because your license sort of follows you around now and you can have multiple licenses applied to a single email account. So you could have multiple versions. I think it's, it's really straightforward. I think it's going to be working really well. But when you go to file and then you can go to quit, you can also say quit and free license. But I also don't think that that is that big of a deal because if I were to jump over right now on my laptop and try and sign in, it's going to say, hey, my license is already being used. And I can say, uh, disable that one, enable it here. So I have found it to be pretty seamless. It could have been a pain in the butt, but it seems to be working really well so far in my experience anyway. The first new feature we're going to be tackling here is one of the more straightforward ones, but I think it's going to be useful for a lot of people. And it's just something that was so, so much of a pain to do in the past. So it involves new caps on extrudes, but specifically text. So let's go ahead and use a mo text, quickest way to see this. Let's just go ahead and type in R21. Let's center it up and let's choose a nice beefy font. It'll show this stuff a little bit better. Let's grab a nice big future of bold. There we go. Maybe extrude that out a little bit further. All right. So just like in R20, you can see that all of the new features have been highlighted in yellow. So you can see we get new stuff under caps and under selections. So let's go through this one step at a time. Now, you know, when we would do the old extrusions with the old bevels, that it would explode really quickly. But now with this new bevel shape and size, as I increase this, you're going to see that the bevels don't explode. They actually will collide with themselves and then create these really, really nice bevels that go all the way to the edge where it actually pinches in pretty much perfectly on the shapes. And if you want to see what it used to do, we can turn off self intersections and increase size and you're going to immediately see the two is going to break and they're just going to pass through each other and start exploding outward. It was always a pain to do this because you'd have to extrude it a very specific amount or it'd start breaking. But now just turn back on uh, self intersections and now these bevel out so nicely. But it's not limited to that. We have other features as well. We've got different shapes. We can turn on curve, and if we introduce this, then now we have a very straight edge, very chiseled look super easily. And look how clean this geometry is, like exactly what the subdivisions are, and it shoots across. And important to note that these subdivisions are still based on the way the 
the letters are subdivided, the edges. So if we go to Object tab, we can change this adaptive setting if I can make more or less of that. And if we wanted to, I could turn on the subdivided setting and now every five units it's going to have a subdivision. But you see how cleanly it's creating all of that. And it also does a really nice job with the UVWs on the uh, caps here. But in addition to that, let's go ahead and put this back to regular display mode. In addition to that, we now can add in additional subdivisions on it, and we can start changing the way this curve looks. We can, you know, pinch this up, go down, look at this nice bevel. Oh, man, how would, I, how would you have done this before? It would have been really difficult to start introducing these types of shapes into, into everything with the uh, older workflow. So we can make all these beautiful-looking bevels. In addition to that, we have solid. Solid, I think, is the most specific one. So if you do a, a nice little one here, you get these little bevels on the edge, but I don't think that's going to be used too often. Uh, but then I really love this step one. Let's go ahead and change our display mode. Here we can create a series of tiny steps getting extruded forward. Let's turn on some SSAO in order to see some shadow on there. And look at these beautiful extrusions that we get pulling out. We can set exactly how many steps we want to see as they get pulled in and out all the way to zero. We have the ability to turn on a separate bevel control so that we have a, we can have a different start and end bevel. We can turn on the caps from one side or the other, just like we used to via start cap and end cap. But one of the coolest things here is the ability to load and save presets. So if we click load preset, look at all these presets that we have in here right away when we click on this, uh, they're even they're even named. Here's a, a basic flat. We've got some rounding. We got like this inverted rounding one. And you click on a preset, and you can still tweak it to be exactly the shape that you want it to be. And we can you know change the shape depth, make these more shallow, change the height. Like there's so many little se settings in here. It's crazy the new combinations you can do. I think I spend uh, all day going through every single setting, but it's really powerful. I want to spend a second talking about the selections. Let's go ahead and make a new material. Let's apply it immediately and just make it some bright color. Let's go ahead and make it a nice orangey color. Now with our selections, we can actually, instead of just having to memorize the what the caps are called, we can actually just expose them now. So we can do something like turn on our start cap. And now you can see our start cap is created. And it's even got this nice little symbol on the icon now in order for us to know that this isn't something that we can manipulate. It just is what it is because it's being generated internally. So I can go to, ahead to this material, drop our selection tag in there, and it looks like it's on the back cap here. So you can see that just that selection was implemented there. We can turn that off, we can go to the shell instead. Let's drag the shell into that material. And you can see it's actually the outside part of it, the original geometry. So exposing those is really nice. And then I want to show one last thing with these features. Let's open up a new file. I'm going to create a N side. And let's create an extrude here. So you can see this is working here as well. And let's hit N B so we can see our subdivisions. Under caps, we have a new cap type. Before we had N gon triangles and quads, and then that's also gotten split out to regular grid. If you turn on a regular grid, you can actually twirl this down and you can change how your grid is looking or go ahead and make it quad dominant to make them squares. So all those settings still exist, but now we also have a Delaunay setting. And what Delaunay does is it creates triangles of kind of decreasing density. So you're not gonna see that very well here because this is very clean. And let's turn off quad dominant. It's very clean, so we just kind of get these triangles. But if I start adding subdivisions to our end, our end side, I'm going to go intermediate points. Let's change it to subdivided. Then you can see I've got all these points on the edge, and you can see what happens is they get translated into triangles, and then a smaller amount of triangles, and smaller and smaller and smaller, and it tries to make these big old triangles at the beginning. So now, based on this density slider, you can see it's going to try and make nice big triangles, so it's not too subdivided, but we get a nice clean mesh, or we can increase our density and it's going to try and subdivide it. It's going to subdivide it a lot and we can go all the way and we're going to get a very even pattern overall. But when I look at some of these subdivisions, it just opens up a lot of possibilities for breaking things apart or exploding things or using the old poly FX, like really great subdivisions here. And you get some really nice random looking patterns. I really like that. And you can turn on quad dominant. That's going to try and make them as many squares as possible. You'll still be left with a handful of triangles, but as many as it can convert, it will. So that works really well. And then the last thing I'll mention here, let's go ahead and delete that. So let's go ahead and make an arc. Let's go ahead and make an end side. T for scale, scale that end side down a little bit. Let's create a sweep. Make both of those splines children of the sweep. And then in the sweep, let's go ahead and change it to step. You can tell I love that one. 
Instead of going positive on it, you get these nice little subdivisions. Why don't we go ahead and go negative on it? And you can see it's going to kind of break backwards. But if we do the proper combination of maybe turning on extend shape and pulling it this direction, you can see we get this really nice enlarging cap. We get this really nice foot at the base here and this extruding out. And it's all still parametric. So we can go back to this pipe and animate this moving up and down. If we fix that fong tag, make that a little bit lower, I think that'll be a little bit cleaner. And like it's just automatically adaptable. And man, I just love playing with this type of parametric setup of getting these really nice uh, arcs and columns and steps and boots. Um, and before I forget, there was one last cool thing I wanted to mention. If we go into our curve, so we got the splines, so we're just looking at spline types here. We don't need to go, uh, let's actually extrude those out further. We can modify this arc just like you'd expect. We can grab it, pull it in, change this, change the curves. But something that's really neat that they've added into the splines here is we can, if we select all of our points, we can right click. And there's two new settings. We have a double and symmetrize. I think it's symmetrize. But if we click on uh, symmetrize, then it's going to make a mirror copy of it. And you see this one point that was on the right is now the middle point. It's even welded so that those are, have become a single point there. And we have now have the ability for it to grow and shrink. So I just thought that was really cool. Let's do it again. Right click, symmetrize, boom, two arcs going. If we want to actually see that doing something here, let's go ahead and symmetrize that. We could add additional segments. You can actually see how it's getting subdivided and we can get two bumps there. And in addition to that, uh, let's hit undo a few times and we've got our uh, main arc here. And now if I right click, I can also say double and you can see it's actually going to repeat this. So overall, it's making the splines behave more like the gradient does where we have the doubling ability and we have uh, the ability to reverse it. So just those two features, man, that adds on so many additional possibilities of ways we can create these, um, these amazing bevels. Okay, let's start getting to some of the crazier stuff. Let's open up a new file, and we're going to be playing with some of the new features inside of fields. Really good way of visualizing this kind of stuff is with a matrix object. The new default is this flat grid. I think it's been that like that for a little bit. But let's go ahead and make this a lot bigger, like 222 by 222, making a whole bunch of clones, and I want to make it round. So I'm going to make a cylinder. So we get this big old cylindrical shape. The main way of manipulating this is by adding an effector, of course. So we click on our MoGraph dropdown. I'm going to add a plane effector. I think it's pushed up into the air. Pretty straightforward. That's working well. Let's push it up twice as far. And let's go into our fall off tab and do something pretty straightforward. Let's make a radial field. And the radial field, of course, is one of the fancy ones. Let's go to our field. Let's make sure there's a full transition here. So it's spinning from one side to the other. Let's go ahead and give it something like five iterations. So you can see it's looping five times. And that's working well. Now, something that is pretty common inside the radio field is going into your offset and adding in something like maybe time. Let's go ahead, ahead and add in a time offset. And what that means by putting it in there is I can hit play, and now it's going to be spinning all of the time. Let's go make sure we turn off clamp so it can keep on spinning forever. And it's going a little fast. So let's drop that down to maybe 60 frames, a rate of 60. And now you can see this is spinning around forever. So what's new? Well, if we go back to the plane effector, we're going to see that our radial field actually has some children now. There's an entire hierarchy. And we can now see the, the offset parameter right here in our main tab. And with it being here in the main tab, that means now we don't, no longer have to go digging deeper and deeper and deeper to, to affect it. Before, you would have had to, have, if you want to manipulate the way that's spinning, you'd have to click onto the radial field, go into the offset tab, click on the time node, and then make changes here. But now it's all right here in the main fall off. We can click directly on time and directly affect the way that these settings are working. And we can manipulate the hierarchy in additional ways directly from this interface. We can create a spherical fall off. Let's go ahead and make sure that's a big old fall off going all the way to the edge here. Let's actually go to the inner offset of zero. And now I can drop that in to the offset and I'm gonna say, let's multiply. So now we're multiplying that and this is now successfully fed into our radial field into the offset it put our spherical field with the multiply but we did it all from this master hierarchy and that is incredibly powerful the next setting that we have is masks let's go ahead to our radial field and let's create a mask and i want to mask off this overall effect that we have going right now this effect is affecting everything equally but why don't we go ahead and through this mask let's make another fall off and in fact you know what i want this exact same spherical field and once again it's really cool field so you can reuse different parts so in this mask i'm going to drag that same spherical field and now that i've done that it's actually fading out from the center to the edges and you see the edges aren't being affected at all so we get all of this big radial from the center moving out to the outside 
we can click on our spherical field and let's go ahead to remapping. Maybe we can invert that. So you get the middle part is not being affected, but the outside is. Let's go ahead and make that a little more extreme by increasing our, uh, our inner offset. We can drag that out. So there we go. We can see how we're getting this nice little flower pattern emerging from the center point going to the edge. And that's all through the power of this new hierarchy right in the main fall off tab. And just keep in mind how crazy fields gets. Right now, we're just using this plane effector, and we're getting all of this motion, no keyframes anywhere. But this entire uh, radial field, this could just be a mask in itself. Let's go ahead and create a brand new, uh, brand new random field. And I'm going to go ahead and say that this random field should be affecting the color and the you know, position, scale, and rotation. Let's go ahead and set the normal so it's completely overriding everything. And you know what? Instead of the plane effector, and right now it's completely overriding, all we're seeing is this, ra this random field. If we click on the plane effector, let's go ahead and say, not position, let's affect instead our Y scale. So we're just going to make things way taller. So that's what the random field is doing. It looks pretty cool. It's neat. But if we go back into our fall off tab, I could say, you know what? Random field, you have a mask. And that mask is going to be this entire radial field that we've been working on. So let's make that the mask. And now you can see that the city is only generating where that mask is allowing it to be generated. So the ability of layering this stuff up is crazier. Oh, man, that looks really cool. It is crazier than it ever has been before. Like just these parametric building. Like I'm trying to imagine how you would make this in pre-R20. And now with R21 and this power of combining masks and seeing everything in the hierarchy, it just makes everything cleaner and faster and so much more powerful. There is one more setting I would like to talk about in fields. But it's really specific, and I'm just going to use kind of a, a ripoff of the example Maxon was doing because I feel like it's the best use case for it because there's a lot of different ways of doing it, and this one's really specific. So let's go ahead and create a simulate particle emitter, and we are emitting particles. Let's go ahead and have this go for longer, and let's crank up our timeline to be longer and make that longer, and let's make these not live as long. Let's say about uh, 90 frames. We'll have them go nice and fast, and I'll even give them a little bit of speed variation, 75% speed variation, or uh, no speed variation. Let's do life variation. Yeah, there we go. So now we can see we're emitting particles. Pretty straightforward. So they're flying along and they are going to slowly die. Let's go ahead and create another matrix object because it's kind of like a cloner, but really quick and set it to object and the object will be the emitter. So you can see that we are now cloning directly onto an emitter. Pretty straightforward. Now, let's go ahead and add on a plane effector as you do. And this plane effector on, side, on top of the matrix is currently just pushing everything up into the air. That's cool. I don't want it to push up though. Let's turn that off. And instead, let's just turn on uniform scale and say that they should get way bigger. Right, let's go way big. So that's what the plane effector is doing. But if we go into the fall off, we can go ahead and drag in our emitter as a source. And I'm going to bring it in as we can do a particle or point object. I'm going to say it's a particle object. And a new setting that they've added in R21 is that the emitter automatically has a color based on the particle's age. So the older it is, the darker it gets. And now that we have that variable, not only is it cool that we can colorize these particles, which is pretty powerful by itself, but now we could convert that color into other settings. Because you see right now, it's not changing the scale at all because the color here, the life, the age of the particle is only a color parameter. So in order to manipulate the scale of the objects with this, we need to use the new field layer called channel convert. So I'm going to go ahead and create that. And something to note right away is this doesn't work until you twirl it down. You can see it has a source. And what source does it need? Well, it needs the emitter. Cool. I'm going to turn off and make blending normal so you get the channel converts just completely taking over. It's doing everything. Now, you don't see anything visually happening right now. And that is because we want to go click on the channel convert. And this took a little bit for me to wrap my head around, but the basic idea is all of the data that could possibly be here is the value of the object, the color channels, the color, the alpha, the channel, the direction channels, and the direction. So right now, value equals value. Alpha equals alpha. It's really straightforward. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I want the value, and that is to say the PSR, the 0 to 100% type of thing. I want that to equal the color. So let's click on value here and change it to color. And the instant that I do that, you can now see that as it gets older, it's shrinking down. So that means the color was white, which is 100%, and it's going to black, which is 0%. So it's just doing that conversion from one side to the other. So this channel convert is the ability to 
put one type of parameter onto another. Now, I don't think it's really straightforward to do that in a lot of other ways. And this, this emitter example is really good because it's the only time you have one piece of data that can only be gotten one way. This could probably be useful in a bunch of different places, but this is the main one I'm seeing. And just keep in mind the amount of control that we can have now here. We've got this channel convert doing its thing, but I could go ahead and let's create a invert. So now I'm gonna invert it. So now the zero and 100 have been flipped and now they get bigger as they go. If I want to, I could create a curve. I could make it so that these are going to be smaller for longer and then get really big at the end. We could do the opposite and make them get bigger quickly. So they get emitted really small and then they're going to scale up and kind of level off a little bit. And then maybe we can say, you know what? And at the very end, I want them to shrink back down again. So they shrink down. Let's have that happen really quickly. So it's going to shrink down. Boop, 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 boop. And they kind of pop down to that. Transition a little bit faster would probably be nicer. Let's say we want to change the color. I can go ahead and grab the the uh, emitter here. Let's drag it into the particle object again. I don't want it to affect the value. So we'll turn that off. And you can see we got the white to black gradient again. Now we can create a nice colorizer. Let's move that directly above the emitter so we can affect that color directly. And that should be colorizing that. So now we can go ahead and change this to maybe a nice teal color. And now you can see we're actually getting a colorized transition between those. So it's a pretty interesting way of transferring the age of a particle onto the value of the particle and having that control this. And that might be valuable in a couple other places in the future as well. But this isn't a breakdown of every single setting. It's just kind of an overview. So let's move on to our next part. All right, we are now going to move in and start talking about what I think is the most powerful new feature in R20 and 1. In fact, I think it's one of the most powerful features that's ever been added into a version of Cinema 4D. It's a little bit advanced and a little technical, though. So let's see if we can step by step this and make it uh, clean and logical. So it is the idea that we're going to be playing with here is going to be field force. And the field force can affect dynamics and it can affect particles. Particles is the more visual way of seeing it. So we're going to start out that way. So let's go ahead and start out by creating ourselves a nice emitter. It's going to be emitting a bunch of particles. Let's have it emit for a really long time. The speed is fine. All that looks good. Let's go ahead and hit R for rotate. We're going to spin this exactly 90 by holding down shift. Let's go ahead and scale this. Yeah, here I'm going to make it really wide, 1,000. And let's grab the X size and set that down to zero. So we just got this nice emitter, hit play, it's gonna be emitting. We need more frames, so let's go ahead up to 999, and we'll scale that up, and why don't we go ahead and even save our scene file just so we can jump back to this if need be. All right, so you're probably all familiar with the way we usually would play around with these types of particles. We would jump in to simulate, we go to forces, and maybe create something like a turbulence, and the turbulence is gonna make them start blowing in random directions. We give that a little bit of scale, a little bit of power, and we get these kind of blowing around all over the place. But we don't really get to visualize that. And we don't have a lot of direct control over that. And we have all these different field forces. Let's go ahead and take a look at the menu. We've got attractors. We've got, uh, we've got friction. We've got gravity. We've got rotation, turbulence, wind. All the ones I just listed have been completely supplanted by field force. Let's go ahead and create one. Field force is sort of all of the forces, and you can combine them all using fields. So let's go ahead and try and do the simplest version of this. If I play right now, nothing's happening yet. But we have to go into our field force, and let's go ahead and add in something. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to create a solid, actually. That's just saying, like, hey, full force, full power, do this thing. Let's create a solid. And in the context of a field force, this is just a vector. It's a direction. So you can think x, y, Z. So currently this is saying Y is one. So it's saying full power on Y. So if we were to hit, well, let's go ahead and take a look at what we got here too. You see, I've got this little gridded box here. We got all these nice little green arrows pointing upward. Let's go ahead and tweak our display here so we can see exactly what we're working with. I'm going to click on display and right now we have line density. Let's go ahead and crank that way up. You can see, oh, okay, lots of lines. We don't need to go that crazy, but this is a nice little display of what should be happening. And you know what? Why don't we go ahead and make this two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional for demonstration purposes. It's going to be easier to understand. So why don't we go ahead and flatten this down to one. So we just got like that one layer and let's make this way bigger. Like I'm gonna say 2000 by 2000 and it's really big. So let's go ahead and increase our density. And now you can see we got all these nice little directional tick marks going in a particular direction. And we said we want everything to travel on Y. Now let's go back to our object tab 
and we have our solid, I'm going to say, you know what, instead of traveling on Y, let's say we have X, we want, or actually Z, I think is the orientation I'd like that to go. So let's go to Z and type in one. And I can see, oh, now the arrows aren't green, they're blue, and you can see they're pointing to the right. Let's say negative one on Z. And now you can see it's changed color again. They've turned yellow, the opposite of blue. So these, we're just manually typing in a direction here. So let's just leave it as one. And let's go back to our object tab. And right now it's saying add to velocity five. So our particles are gonna go shooting upward, but now we have a field force saying blow on Z direction. So if I hit play, we're immediately gonna see everything begin curving off to the right. So, okay, right away, that's pretty cool, pretty straightforward. It's like a wind direction that we have a very nice fine-grained control over. So that's just blowing it off to the side. We could change the orientation by saying negative one, and suddenly everything's gonna be blowing off to the other side. Right now, it's set to velocity type, add to velocity, but we have three modes here. There's add to velocity, which is constantly adding on power. It's kind of like the way wind or turbulence traditionally work. But we also have set to absolute velocity, and you can see this is suddenly going really slow. And that's because every refresh, it's not adding five. It's saying, no, 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 five is your total amount. That's full power. So in order to see this, why don't we go ahead and make this just vertical on Y. You can see they're moving up, but they're moving up very slowly. So why don't we go ahead and say that their strength is 50. Okay, 10 times the speed, let's say that it's 500. And now you can see, now we've got some speed going. Now they can travel up. You can also see though, that now that we're traveling at such a speed, all of our little direction here, our vector, our normal direction, has scaled up really big. In fact, why don't we start introducing a little Z on it? And you can see if I tick it up one, these lines have gotten really long. That makes it a little bit harder to see what's happening. So we can actually go back to the display tab and we have a, if we twirl down display vector length, you can turn that off and then we just get a set length and it won't ever change. I kind of like getting the length feedback though. It's good feedback. So I like turning it on and then going to our, our displayed length and setting it down to something smaller. So I'm gonna try 0.1, actually 0.1 in this instance is a little, is a little weak, so let's say 0.05. And there we go, now they've gotten to a reasonable length where they're not running into each other. So we've got this really nice wind and it's blowing off the side. Why don't we go ahead and save our scene file and continue. So that is like the most straightforward possible implementation of this. We have a solid force that's saying do this particular thing. Let's start making it a little bit fancier. I've got a, let's set it to add velocity again. No. Nope. I don't know, it's a tough thing, it's a tough call of all the crazy combinations we could do here. It's gonna be really hard to explain. And this isn't supposed to be a tutorial on using every part of this, it's just the overview. So why don't we leave it on, actually let's do a change direction. So what change direction does, it's the third type, which I even kind of forgot to mention. What this is going to do is just absolutely take our initial speed and force it into the new direction. So we've got this solid, if I were to turn that off, you see our particles are shooting upward, and I can turn that solid back on and they're gonna turn right. That's all well and good. But what I can do is let's create a mask on that solid. And what should the mask be? Well, let's make a spherical fall off and I'm gonna drop that as the mask. And we have to make sure it's affecting the value, so let's turn that on. And now that I've done that, I can go ahead and pull our spherical field. Let's pull this up into the air and you can now see that those little blue arrows are limited just inside of this fall off. So we are now having this 100% powerful effect changing the direction to suddenly start flying to the right. And the reason it's completely powerful even though it's got this fall off is because there is no other vector, everything else is zero, it's just taking the original speed. Because in the field force, there's nothing else except for what's limited here. So we can start combining these things. Let's make a second solid, I'm gonna move it down below and let's have it affect the direction and it's already set on Y. So now you can immediately see that all of these are pointing up on Y, they're setting the direction, but now this is combined in a more interesting way. You can see that these are flowing up, the fall off is taking over and it's changing the direction until it exits the sphere and then it begins going straight again because it's got this other field, it's got this other direction to be traveling. So this, is where things start getting pretty crazy. So we got like this little sphere fall off, but we can go ahead and let's make a second sphere fall off. And let's go ahead into our mask here and let's add in that second sphere and let's say, add those together. So now I've got a second sphere field and I can scoot this one over here. And now we have two sphere fields, each pushing off to the side. Okay, that's cool. But we could change the radius. We could change the fall off. We can, yeah, let's change the fall off. So this is gonna get smoother. And you can see how these arrows are changing direction. They're not arrows, but I'm gonna probably keep referring to them as that, so. 
uh, you can see that's really smoothly falling off and changing that direction. Let's go ahead and that's working fine. I like the way this looks. Let's go ahead and create a brand new spherical fall off. Actually, let's do something different. Let's make a box fall off. Um, box fall offs are a little weird. Let's leave a sphere. I'm gonna make a spherical field. It's a brand new spherical field here. Let's go ahead and pull it up in the air and let's see what's happening. Well, not much yet. And that's because this isn't turned on and right now it's set to max. Uh, we could turn it on normal and I think normal is what I want. And you see naturally what a spherical field does is it's making things point in a particular direction. So let's go ahead and give it no fall off. So you can see what's happening on this is all of the arrows I think are pointing inward, maybe outward, I don't know. But yeah, there we go. So as I pull it in, you can see, especially as I drag it in, everything's getting sucked into the center. So this is like an attractor, but now we have control over the fall off. I could say, you know what? I wanna fade into this. So things are gonna be attracted a little bit on the edge and then curve into the center. It's like, okay, that's crazy. We can go into our direction tab inside of every field and we go into direction and we can change how powerful it is with this scale slider. But we can also turn on invert direction. And now instead of this being an attractor, it's now repulsing. It's now pushing these points away. You see, as I move this around, all of our points are getting forced away from this position. And it is just kind of being added. It's just like overriding what's underneath it because we set this to normal, but we can do things like set this to add. So it's adding that based on it. So it's pushing away, but it's going with the flow. So we don't get this big slowdown on it. Let's wait for the particles to catch up. We don't get all this big slowdown. It's actually continuing with that curvature, but getting pushed away as well. Now, once again, keep in mind that we're doing this on a two-dimensional plane in order to simplify it. But there's no reason that this couldn't be a big, giant, three-dimensional field of particles, and we couldn't be working with it that way. But let's uh, go ahead and give this another save and continue tinkering around with it. Let's go ahead and simplify this a little bit. Hit play, let's delete our two spherical fields and I don't want that middle solid anymore. So everything that's happening, they're going upward because of our solid saying to travel upward and we got our spherical field which is gonna push them apart. So let's go ahead and add something in like a random field. The instant we add a random field, it's being combined to be the max and you can now see that there's a little bit of variation. These are wiggling around. The important thing to note is that the random field is on all three directions, all three vectors. So if I ro rotate my camera now, it's not flat anymore because these are kind of projecting them left and right. So we'll just kind of ignore the fact that th that's happening. But what's important to note is that if we click on a random field, there's a lot of really cool settings in here. By default, it's now being created with a Perlin noise that's pretty tiny. But if we start enlarging that, let's jump it up to a thousand, you can start seeing a little bit of uniformity between these. And now we start getting like these beautiful flows. Look at how, like these just traveling through space. Like that's so cool. Now keep in mind that's being added. It's max. So it's kind of being, in a way it's being added to the fields below it. So it always has this upward direction. But if we set that to normal, it should be, um, in fact, if we turn the other ones off, it still combines in interesting ways. But if we turn it off, you can see that the randomness is everywhere. And it's, it's gonna find these points where everything gets blown in the same position. So that doesn't work. So kind of leaving the other layers up works. And I haven't completely absorbed the way all of these things combine because this is set to normal. So you'd think it would override, but clearly it doesn't affect everything in that way. But in any case, uh, we've got these all traveling upward, but with some additional randomness. If we want to, we could jump in the random and I could give it some animation speed. So let's give it uh, 111 animation speed. So you're going to see these slowly rotating and changing direction. You can see that's really breaking apart our pattern a little bit. They're not doing these consistent lines. We could have them continue doing their lines if we make it pretty slow. So we'll slow that down and we'll see the lines form a little bit more. So automatically, pretty crazy, pretty cool. We couldn't have done this before. An important thing to note here is even though these part of, we've kind of got this grid here, this display grid, which is showing us what's happening. But you can see it continues calculating even beyond that. Each particle is individually going through the field force list and being like, okay, how am I affected by random? How am I affected by the sphere? How am I affected by solid? So this is just a way of us seeing it. So it's not like the resolution of this matters. The resolution doesn't have any bearing on this whatsoever. Each point is being calculated exactly precisely as it should be as it's flowing through. This density's got nothing to do with it. Just thought I should throw that out there. Let's go ahead and probably even give this another save and figure out what's next. So let's go ahead and simplify again. We don't need the random field. 
Uh, so we don't need the spherical field. Uh, let's go ahead and start adding in some objects. And I thought this is where it gets really crazy, really powerful. Right now, everything's going to be continuing to travel upward. But let's go ahead and create an arc shape. Let's make sure it is actually intersecting with our plane a little bit. And let's go ahead and do our field force and make it having an effect. And I like making it a child just because, you know, it keeps it a little more organized. Now, that's going to look a little bit weird starting out. Like, what is what is this orientation? If we hit play, it's going to definitely have some very strange effects. So we kind of have to go through this in a logical way. Let's go into our field force, click on the arc, and see exactly what we have happening. Well, right now, there's kind of a fall off happening. So what I found is when you add a spline in, you want to crank up your offset all the way. So that's full strength. And now, visually, it's a little bit more obvious what's going on. You see where this... If a point is closest to that point on the spline, it's flowing in that direction. But this point is closest to that one, so it's flowing in the direction that is. And all of these are closest to that one. And then right here is where that transition is happening. So very important to keep in mind, you wanna do a full offset to make a spline behave, I guess, logically. So now if I hit play, we're gonna see these particles flow and it seems like uh, our spline is going from start to end. So I'm gonna click on the arc and say, reverse your points. So you, know, you can see it's green, which means they're traveling upward and you're gonna see these all curve around. And right here, they're getting like this really harsh change of direction. But that's pretty cool and that's pretty interesting. Now this drove me nuts for a long time, but once I figured it out, it was like, okay, that makes sense. Is this is having full power all the time. Now there's this, a different mode, and that is if we change our spline to not be calculating from the distance along, but doing a radius. And by doing a radius, let's go ahead and start increasing this radius, you're gonna see that we've kind of got this little fall off, and what's going to happen is any particle that comes near is going to get pulled to it, but I don't know, it's just like this, this visually isn't what I was kind of hoping. You'd kind of hope that you could get them to travel along the spline, but not be attracted from every direction from full power. So this is cool with what it's doing. And once again, we can go to the arc and we go to direction and we can say invert the direction. So now it's pushing those part particles away. So when this gets near, it's gonna flow around it and we get that fall off, but that's not quite what I want. So how do you make it actually do what I'm describing? Well, we're gonna go back to the arc here. Let's go back to the layer. And I do want it to be along. It's going to travel along and let's go ahead and reverse that again. Oh, it, it, yeah, it, you can reverse it by changing the order of the spline, or I also changed it by going to direction and inverting the direction. But let's go ahead into our arc and let's add a mask. With this mask, we can drag in the arc a second time. And so now this is, a, this is flowing the way we want, but it's affecting everything. But now with the mask, let's go ahead and set the mask to be distance mode radius, and then let's give that a radius. In fact, why don't we pause this and go back so we can see our flow. And you can see as I increase the radius, these are curving to match our shape. Now, this is what I was looking for. These are gonna flow up, they're gonna get near the object, follow the curve, and then begin flowing forward again. That is crazy, this is so powerful. This is making particles, and we haven't even gotten to it yet, but dynamics, so art directable. It is insane. It's like completely boggling my mind. And keep in mind that this is actually three-dimensional. Right now we're treating it like it's 2D, but this actually has like a, a cylinder like almost swept along it, and that is the direction. So this stuff gets crazy. So we've got that going, but something a, ray, a little rig that I found kind of useful is let's go ahead and select the arc, and then let's go to our little uh, generators here. I'm going to hold down Alt as I create a connect, and now there's a parent that's a connect. And now I can go into my field force and I'm going to drop the connect onto the arc. I'm going to drop the connect onto the other arc. And you see it's just continuing to behave. It's working exactly the way we want. But now instead of dragging in the spline again and again and again, I can just copy the arc and now I have a second one. And I can hit T for scale and scale a second one. And you can see that's automatically adopting into the field force and our particles are now flowing across that one as well. So just with these two splines in here, you can really see the possibilities we could we could create. I can grab this one, I can move, let's grab the first one actually, and let's scoot this one down here. Let's make another copy. And then I'm going to, I don't know, let's uh, spin this 90 degrees, that orientation, and let's spin it 90 degrees, this orientation. And let's go ahead and pause that so I can see this a little bit better. And now I can pull this one up here. And now you can see our curve is continuing from there into there to then travel upward. 
or we can just draw whatever spline we want at all in here. But let's just go ahead and check that out. Really straightforward, but this can flow upward and then transfer to that one and start traveling that direction as well. The way these things start layering up is absolutely insane. Let's go ahead and give this a save. I'm gonna go ahead and open up a scene file I created right here. So this is kind of the same idea as we've been talking about a little bit here, but you can see I've really been layering up some different things. So you can see that it's gonna start out with a bunch of particles and they're flowing through some randomness and then they get pinched here. And then I have a different randomness here that as they travel up, they're gonna start spreading apart because the randomness is being reintroduced. And then we have some attractors, some negative attractors, which are pushing away the shapes. Here we have a radial, like the old radial field spinning around with a fall off. So it's actually forcing them to spin around the shape. These are all gonna to continue to flow and scatter upward. They're all being pinched into this kind of one, you know, this 2D field here by having one linear blowing one direction and another linear blowing the other direction. And then they're gonna continue flowing upward, striking these different shapes. And they're gonna get pinched in here a little bit. Actually it takes a little bit for those to travel because they go uh, pretty slow up there. But you just see like how all of these combine. You can see in here, there's different mask layering up and it's just, like, it's so insane. Like look at how I'm art directing this. Instead of using a whole series of crazy winds and rotators and attractors, like it's all a single field force and they're all flowing up here. They're traveling into this middle point, getting pinched down here. There's another randomness, which is forcing them to spread out into this infinite little spray. And it's still being treated pretty much as two dimensional. Like this is crazy. This is this is just regular old Cinema 4D particles. The idea of us being able to make something like this is just insane. Let's go ahead and try another scene file. Uh, this one's just a slightly more complex version of the splines we were just tinkering with. You see a whole bunch of splines layered up. Everything's being forced to curve along there. And even though that's where we're getting our preview, keep in mind that's calculating everywhere. So even though this is pretty much 2D, now it's going to introduce a kind of three-dimensional segment here where those particles can travel along that outside and they'll just continue traveling forever. It's, it's so crazy. Let's anyway, go, let's close that and go back to our scene file right here. Not that one. Let's go back to the one we've been making from scratch. And let's take a look at a couple of other little things. Let's try adding some different objects in here. I'm going to delete the splines. Let's delete the spline mask. We've got our solid. Why don't we go ahead and tinker with text for a moment? Let's create a text object. Let's go ahead and change its orientation to be looking flat on us. Middle, let's say R21, couple exclamation marks. Move this up, hit T for scale, make that a little bit bigger. And let's drag that into our field force and see what we get. Well, right away, you can see it's flowing around on the orientation. But just like we saw before, we want full offset. So now you see everything is being forced to flow based on what's nearest but we also need that fall off. So let's go ahead and create a mask. We'll make the text a child of the mask and we'll give that a radius so that, that can fall off there. So now we have the direction flowing around the spline, but it's got a more limited radius. I'm gonna grab our emitter T for scale, scale that up a little bit bigger so we get more particles traveling along. Let's see what we get. Oh, look at that. These are now flowing around the text. Now here they're getting a little bit trapped in that circle. But, we, you know, they're flowing up and around. So if we were to chill that out a little bit, let's go to our radius. We can start decreasing this radius so that they can, they can now flow past. And you can see some of these are seem to be getting trapped inside of the R. These are a little bit more straightforward, so they're just going to flow up and away. But, you know, we can increase that radius and start trapping things even more. We can actually have these flowing all the way around. If our emitter was in such a position, let's go ahead and give it some height and let's rotate it so we're flat on and this is completely taking over our direction so if i let them emit originally from here then there's particles everywhere and you see that they're going to be traveling the entire shape until they kind of get flung off from some corner so the combination of these is just really really fun let's go ahead and drag in a scene file i have uh, here's the word moo and now you can see that these particles are being generated right on the corner and they're traveling around it. If we go ahead and take a look at our field force, you see that the flow is traveling really nicely, broadly around the overall object. And like, oh man, it's just so crazy, so powerful. Like how would we have done this in the past? Like I just have no idea.
Now, we're probably spending too long on Field Force already, and man, there's going to be some tutorials coming out about this, believe you me. But I did want to spend a moment and show you this setup I have. It's a little bit more complex because what's happening is we've got a bunch of cubes up here, and I have a dynamic tag on them. And not only is it dynamic, they're actually soft body, but they have a lot of stiffness. So that makes it so that every point is being affected. And let me hit play for a second here. And you're going to see that there's an emitter, and the emitter is shooting out little insides. And the insides are flying upward and the insides are going to are generating this radius around it which is like a negative attractor so it's forcing things away and then they also have a tail which is pushing things upward so these are being randomly emitted and our cubes are falling and everything's being forced to kind of behave in a 2d way so if i were to uh, hit play and let these continue traveling upward the boxes are going to start being struck by these individual little kind of like firework things and the force is pushing them upward and they're actually getting flung purely by wherever these particles are. And it's just, you know, the idea of doing this kind of thing, it's just so insane. Like, this is so crazy. It's so powerful. And these are, these are nice little two-dimensional two -dimensional boxes, but the idea of having some sort of paper traveling along in here is really great, too. So here's another scene file where it's, you can see it's really straightforward. I've got a helix and the helix is, is being told to have it travel along with a full offset. And then there's a little bit of randomness and I've got a plane object, a nice, you know, generic plane object here, still parametric and it's got soft body on it. And with those combined, I can hit play. And now this is being forced, no keyframes to travel along this spline with all this nice little flow happening and this randomness and it's gonna come off there and I think it's just gonna keep flying around and around because of course, if we take a look at our field force, we've got this big old circle traveling around. Let's go ahead and make this even bigger, it's huge. Let's say 5,000 by 5,000 by 5,000. And actually this one doesn't need to be, that can be two dimensional. You can see that this is just a big radial because it's referencing whatever is most close to it. And you get all the randomness on top and you just get this flowing around. It's so crazy. And we can just go to our soft body settings and change. We could say change our structural so that this could be more stretchy and the shear so it could bend more. We could get rid of the energy being drained out from the system. And we get this thing bl blowing through the wind a lot more randomly. We could add some stiffness so the original shape has to be maintained a little bit. And just the idea of this, of being able to art direct a soft body in this way, have it, have it move in this direction and flow in these ways it's just insane. It's not, it's something that we couldn't have even considered before. It would have been such a pain in the butt to build something like this. I had some rigs that might do some somewhat similar things, but just the, the, these field forces are so crazy. It's every single other force combined in more crazy, interesting ways than we ever had before that we can feed in splines, feed in objects, drive regular dynamics, drive soft body dynamics, drive particles. It's just absolutely insane. Now, if you didn't think that was quite crazy enough, let's open up a new scene file and look at our next new feature in R21, which is tying in very directly with all this. Inside of our volumes, inside of our volume builder, in fact, there is a new mode. We always had sine distance field and fog, but now we've got a vector, and this is just storing those vectors, those directions. And what we can do with this is start feeding in objects much like we were doing before. So let's go ahead and make this circle and drop that in. And boom, we've got this little, little vector circle behaving much in the way the other one was, except there aren't additional, additional vectors outside of it. But let's go ahead and make a second circle. And let's pull this one over. And one is sort of overriding the other. But we can go into the vector field here into our volume builder. And I can say that I should add these together. And now they've become combined. You can subtract them from each other. You can do a cross product of each other. I don't even know what some of the stuff means. Um, actually, that one combines really nicely. But with these combined, where I think this really gets powerful is these modifier layers. We can do things like create a vector smooth. And what this one is going to do is this really nice smooth transition from one to the other one. So we kind of are blurring these vectors between each other and smoothing them out. And that's going to create an ability to create even crazier shapes than we were before. Like the idea of blurring these together. Like that's so crazy. We can add uh, something like a, a curl. I honestly don't even know exactly what this means. I haven't been able to read any documentation yet. But that's adding in all this randomness that's kind of following along the surface. The uh, ability to add an absolute rotation to it. So we can grab all these and say, you know what? I want these to rotate on Y by 90 degrees. And they all rotate directly to do that. 
And then on top of that, you got things like uh, invert to just make it the opposite, to change the opposite direction. And man, they just they just layer up so so crazy, so straightforward. And then even these like this invert, this rotate. Th these well, like yeah, these have a field fall off on it, where you could have this rotate fall off over a certain speed, or it can rotate things as a linear field was passing through it. And uh, even the smooth, you could have the smooth only smoothing certain areas of it. So that gets crazy. And then ultimately, all of these are just a layer you can add into the field force in another setting, where it's like you're using the particles, they're shooting up, use a field force, and you drop this in as a single element, much in the way we're using the spherical falloffs or a random. You just build it right on top of it with this. And they're all being visualized, and they're right there. I, I haven't even begun to wrap my mind around all of the potential possibilities on here. But it is really crazy. I actually have a more specific example I'd like to show that I think will show off the volume builder even better. I'm going to set this over to vector. And the first thing I want to do is create a particular direction. Now, the volume builder doesn't have something like a solid, so we're going to have to use a linear field. I'm going to drop that inside the volume builder. And now you see we get a direction. So I want this to be a specific size. So in the volume builder, I'm going to go ahead and take our X, make it down to 1, and let's make this... 2,000 by 2,000. So we got this big old grid just heading in a particular direction. Now, let's go ahead and create a random field. Let's drop the random field in there. And you can see we get this random field just creating crazy noise right in the center. But why don't we go on the random field here? Actually, let's go in the volume builder. And I'm going to say that the random field, sh the shape shouldn't be based on this box. It should be based on whatever is below it. So you can see it's the exact, it's adapted the exact same shape. Very useful. Now, let's make this random field have some particular settings. Right now, it's a Perlin noise. If we made it bigger, we can see the pattern emerge, which is pretty nice. But we have all these other noises, which I barely begin to play with. So we can do something like cell. That's a little weird. But let's try El Voronoi. And now we get this really nice kind of almost like diamond pattern going around. But there's a problem. And the problem is that the pattern has kind of three dimensions. It can aim up or down, left or right, in or out. And I kind of want to treat this in a 2D way. A lot, a lot of things are a lot more controllable in 2D. So there's no way of forcing this in that direction. But with the volume builder, there is because we have different modes of combining things. So right now it's set to normal, but we can set this to add and subtract, but there's also the cross product. And by putting the cross product, it's I think it's kind of taking one shape and multiplying it by the other. And because the original shape was 90 degrees, this one is continuing to be 90 degrees. It's become very flat. And now these have turned in these nice radials. And that is actually exactly what I wanted. And you can Im already imagine how particles will flow through this field. We're not going to actually put the particles in. But now on top of that, we can go and do something like create a vector smooth. And we can very clearly see what this vector smooth is introducing. We have these very kind of harsh patterns with no transition. But as we add in this smoothing, they're going to start blurring between each other. You get those smoother transitions from one shape to another. And we could even start uh, adding in additional iterations here. You can see it's going to smooth more and more and more. And we can pull this down and see the patterns emerge a little bit more on top of it. So you, we can use the volume builder to create even more complex things. Another important thing to note is that the field force can be integrated into thinking particles. Here's a very basic thinking particles rig. If we double click, we can see that we've got, uh, we're generating from the null, putting it to a group, the group comes out, we make a P force object. And in there, you can just drag into the parameter of the force field. And in this case, we've just got a nice little spherical field and a radial and a random. Let's just go ahead and link those two things up. And you can immediately see the thinking particles are being affected via this field force, which is actually incredibly powerful. One of the clunky things about thinking particles is how much time you have to spend inside of Expresso connecting nodes. But now with this being external like this, it's pretty trivial to go through and be like, oh, you know what? The uh, I want the random noise to be animated and then go ahead and give that some animated speed. And I, speed. And I never had to build a rig or go into Expresso to make that happen. And we can get that motion pretty much for free right on top of it. Um, and in addition to that, it's probably important to note that with thinking particle, uh, in thinking particles, it doesn't have to be the field force. We could go ahead and just turn it off entirely. And we can make a simulate wind or let's make a turbulence is usually a good example. Let's go ahead and give that a strength of 55, get a little bit of scale, grab our P force object and tell it to reference the turbulence instead. And now we're going to be able to see that these are being affected by the turbulence 
this turbulence force. And it's just really nice to be able to finally integrate those into thinking particles. It almost makes me want to give uh, thinking particles another little uh, uh, tinker around with them a little bit more. Now, let's go ahead and transition into our next set of settings. I have nothing to do with the field flow, but they do use the volume builder. So let's just continue with this theme. So let's go ahead and create our volume builder and look at the first simple setting, which I think is pretty cool. Let's go ahead and create a spline. We'll give it a zero radius there, zero height. Let's go ahead and drop it into the volume builder. We give ourselves a decent resolution here. And now you can see if we click on a spline, we immediately have a spline scale here, which is super great. We used to have to use a matrix or a most spline rather to make this work. And now you can just do it directly. Give it a solid radius, give it plenty of subdivisions with a density. And now you can just directly control the shape of this. And like I mentioned before, you can now select your spline, all the points right click. And I can say, you know, do a symmetry on here. And now we're doing the spline twice and it's wrapping around there more. And, you know, to see these smaller ones, we have to add more and more small voxels. But that's really great. And the idea of doubling it now, so we get double this effect, like that's really cool. So that's a really straightforward new setting. On top of that, let's go ahead and open up a new file here because I want to talk about caching in volumes. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop open a file I had from when R20 came out. You can see it takes a little bit of time for it to open. You can see we've got this mo text and there's a whole bunch of gibberish where it's traveling around the outside. There's a whole bunch of volumes. There's a bunch of different objects all layered up making these cool shapes. So that's working well, but I want to change the text on here. And if I were to, let's just grab this and I'm gonna type in some other gibberish. If we just click and wait for this to refresh, it's going to take a decent amount of time. So why don't we go ahead into our volume builder and I'm going to create a cache layer. Let's go ahead and pull this up here. Let's go ahead and create a cache layer right here. And I'm gonna go ahead and say cache it. So now everything from that point and below should be cached and it doesn't have to do those calculations. So now if I were to copy this new text, go into our most spline and update that, it is not gonna take nearly as long for that to refresh because it didn't have to do all the calculations below it. And of course the big super slow one is smoothing, but that's now been cached away and we didn't have to worry about it. And then the scene file is very useful for showing something else that's been added in R21. Inside of our volume mesher, we can actually turn on something called create curvature map. If I turn that on and we scale our viewport to be seeing this correctly, it creates a vertex map. Now we can't make any edits to that directly unless we made the entire thing editable, but we can jump inside of a material or a bunch of other objects. But specifically, let's make a uh, turn on the luminance channel to see this very obviously and create a vertex map and let's drag in our vertex map there and we should see right in the viewport that it is creating these nice little kind of convex and concave shapes and we'd be able to you know, like put rust in certain areas or put dirt in certain areas probably deform certain things in certain ways based on it. a lot of possibilities are opened up by that tag being exposed and being parametric and uh, there's an addition, additional setting to change this to specifically convex or concave, but I think this is another neat addition. Our next feature is copy and paste. We're gonna open up this little scene file. We got our cute little mouse character here I made a while ago, and we've got the mouse and we've got the cloak. I'm gonna go ahead and select all of the polygons of his cloak and just control or command C, copy. Let's go to the mouse and paste, and there we go. These have been copy and pasted from one model to the other. In addition to that, we could go ahead and just select something like this. Let's grab a couple of his hairs. Let's grab those two hairs. Uh, UW, select connected, and then copy, and then paste. And now we've got a copy of those. And I could spin them, rotate them around. And now I've got a couple of extra hairs there on his... Uh, on his mesh. In addition to that, it's pretty simple to copy and paste multiple things from multiple files. If we were to, let's just say, take this mouse and I'm going to copy and paste him, the entire character. So we've got two copies. I could go ahead and select both of them and let's select part of one. So let's do a UL loop selection, maybe get closer to the neck here. Let's do a little loop selection around the neck and we'll do a loop selection UL. UL around the neck, I'm gonna say UF, select his head, and then this will select the body. I can now copy, you know, I can copy, and if I were to paste right now, it's going to paste all that geometry. Uh, I'm not even sure, oh yeah, if I copy and paste, it's actually gonna paste both of the pieces of geometry to both of them. So it actually copy and pasted the body and the head and pasted them 
the body and the head onto both on using their local coordinates. Uh, if I were to deselect it and paste, then it's going to paste just that geometry as a new set of objects. So we've got those copy and pasted from multiple objects. But like I said, if I select, let's, now we've got the separated, copy that head, select the body, paste the head onto the body, you can see it actually jumped into the proper position because it's using their local coordinates. So you can actually copy and paste from multiple objects and it will jump into the correct spot based on where the axis is. So yeah, copy and paste between objects is pretty powerful. You can also do points, but that's less useful than uh, polygons. You cannot do edges because edges cannot exist properly without their corresponding polygon and or point. Uh, but copy and paste, a very nice addition. All right, next up is pretty straightforward, but I think it's pretty neat and potentially powerful. Open up a new file, and we are going to look at the new denoiser that is built into the renderer. So in order to create a scene file really quickly, that's going to be relevant to what we're doing. I'm going to actually open up the light kit browser from Grayscale Gorilla. I was the lead developer on this, so I know this should work well for this test. Let's go ahead and pop open something like Neo Noir. It's going to open up a whole scene file for us. We got some spears. We got a whole bunch of lights. Let's set up some render settings real quick. So I'm going to pop open render settings, command or control B. And let's go ahead and change this over to physical. And let's go to our physical tab. In fact, let's go ahead and add in some global illumination. And I don't have any particular settings. I just want this to go very quickly. So let's do a light mapping, maybe a QMC, maximum depth. I'll lower that down. That's all fine. And let's jump to physical, and I'm going to really lower this stuff down. Let's go down one, 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 one. Very, very quick setup here. So let's go ahead and just hit uh, render. In fact, why don't we I'm gonna not save it, but let's send that out to the picture viewer so we can do a little A-B test. So that's rendering, and you can see that this is processing, and you see we've got all of this grain, mostly from the GI and from just the general low settings that we fed into this scene file. Rendering pretty quick overall. Now let's jump into our back to our render settings, right click, and we're going to add in the brand new denoiser. This one's easy to explain because there's not much in the way of settings. You can set up some of these different passes where you can maybe output the material color or the, uh, uh, what is it, albedo layer. Uh, but I'm not even going to worry about that, not do anything. It literally just is turned on and exists now. So let's go ahead and do that render a second time. So it's going to do the exact same process. It's going to take just as long to render that initial thing. But let's keep a close eye because the instant it finishes, it's going to run that as a post effect. And the denoiser should run. And let's see what we get. Boop. Look how smooth that went and made everything. It's pretty good. If you were in an animation, you had the render settings this low, I, mean, I you're probably going to get a little bit of flicker. But the idea it, that you're kind of cleaning up from this to that automatically, it's pretty good. I am pretty impressed. And here it looks like it added about a second of render time. So along those lines, it's pretty nice. Cranking up those render settings a little bit would probably go a long way. Setting up the separate pass, I think, would probably be a good idea. Not that I know much about that specifically. It does render as a post process. It is based on uh, the Intel Open Image Denoiser. So uh, it's just a neat little additional feature here to make your physical and standard. And I think Pro Render renders all just look better faster. So a great little addition. Okay, up next is a nice little organizational tool that I can totally see using if I was using a complicated scene or if I was working with a team. I'm going to go ahead and pop open a scene we were looking at earlier. It's not terribly well organized. I have all of these kind of negative attractors here, but there's nothing calling them out. I didn't name them in a particular way. So I think something I could do is select all of those spherical fields and jump to the basic tab, twirl down icon settings, and we can now turn on an icon color and say, let's get a custom color. Actually, it's a display color. I'm going to say custom. And now you can see all of them turned from pink to yellow. So whatever my naming scheme or coloring scheme could be or, you know, while organizing, it's like, oh, okay, maybe yellow means that these are being used as attractors. And those are all now obviously linked to each other. And we can change this to any, obviously any color that we're interested in turning it into. So pretty useful little addition there. Uh, and you can also set it to, we have a display color and turn that on. And you could have this be displaying the exact same way. That is... In addition to that, we also have this file, this icon file slash ID. And well, what is that? Well, if you open up your command manager, and the best way to do that is hit shift C and type in command, and we can go to customize command. So let's pop that open. So we got our little command manager here. 
and we've got all of these different objects with all these different crazy icons. And we could find something and we wanted to maybe behave a little differently. Oh, you see, we got this constant shading icon. It's similar, but different. We've also got this constant shading. That's kind of neat looking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to right click and copy this ID number. And I'm going to click on all of our little spherical fields. And let's go ahead and paste that in. Delete the ID because we just want the number. And then click off of it. Look at these icons. As soon as I click off of it, boom, all of the icons have updated to whatever I want to set that as. So if I was kind of building this nice little custom rig, I want to call things out specifically. It's just a neat little additional detail to throw on there. There's also some different presets on here that they set up. And there's a good chance you can probably save additional new ones in there. So if you wanted these all to be uh, feet, then those can all be feet now. And it's a neat way of uh, being a little more organized. All right, we're getting to some of these smaller ones now. Let's go ahead and jump into a new scene file. Let's keep it real simple. I'm going to create maybe a flower object here. Let's drop the petals down a few. Let's create a nice little, uh, let's see, let's make a pyramid shape. Make sure it's facing on Z plus because in cinema that means forward. That's the forward direction. T for scale, scale it down a little. Let's right click and add a align to spline you also see they reorganized the layout of this menu here there's no longer just cinema 4d tags but they've been broken apart i definitely am finding this pretty intuitive so that works for me but we've now got this aligned to spline i'm going to feed in this spline i'm going to set, go ahead and say tangential so it's actually aiming and we can go ahead and start increasing this and you see it's going to be traveling around doing its thing now if you remember in the past we were clamped from zero to one but now we can actually overshoot it beyond 100 percent and now we can just keep on looping around and around and around which is good that helps with things like motion blur but in addition to that we can also go negative which is pretty cool it's just a nice to have that value unclamped it's a very very tiny thing but useful to me here's a short one but worth mentioning like I said, they've been updating the core of Cinema 4D, and there's the new modeling core. And there's a bunch of things that have been implemented into the new system. Uh, so grow, shrink, and convert selection have all been updated. Select connected, melt, disconnect, smooth shift, spline to mesh generators, split has a significant speed up, and polygon group to object has significant speed up. And I've definitely dealt with that when you have like an entire city and you're saying, hey, explode all the different chunks in the separate ones. If that's faster, that's great. Most of these are just kind of worth mentioning that they've been updated and they're in the new code. So it should be better and faster, stable, more ready for the future. The only one that there's actually a difference worth checking is grow selection. Pop open a new file here. If I create a plane make this editable and select the polygon. The growth is different than it used to be. The shortcut is UY as always, but you can now see that it grows the entire square. Where in the past, if you grow, if I had just that selected, the growth would have looked like that. But now it can select based on the point on the corner. So that is a, a nice little addition to uh, that growing a little bit more consistently the way you might expect it to. Next up, the Project Asset Inspector. You re might remember the old Texture Inspector by going to your mode here, going to Project Info, clicking on Textures, and you get a list of all your textures. So what they've done is they've expanded that idea to the Project Asset Inspector. Let me show you a scene file that will show this off really well. This is actually a pinball machine I designed for half res last year, and you can control it inside of Cinema 4D. So if I hit play here, then I can go ahead and shoot the uh, pinball, and then it's gonna bounce around. You can hear sound effects, and there's some textures in here. And there's just a lot going on, and I have control over this using the arrow keys. So it's a really fun little project. Well, let's go ahead and let that drain. And let's go ahead and pop open our Project Asset Inspector. So you can see that right now it is having trouble finding a bunch of stuff in this scene file. It's finding these materials, but a lot of these sound effects, it's not doing a good job. So the Project Asset Inspector can view much in the way it used to do textures. It can now do images, video, sound files external like ABC files, FBXs, like GI caches, all of that stuff. Uh, it's kind of got everything covered and it's got all those nice texture asset settings. If I select all these and I say um, like relink assets, I can go and navigate down to my sound effects folder for that, hit the OK, and it's like, oh, OK, I just found all of these, everything except for this one EXR. So it's a really good way of relinking all of your assets. And you know, in this case, I actually needed to find those so that's a very nifty new tool.
Next up, a little talk about UVWs, mostly just UVs. A bunch of the primitives, mostly objects like the cylinder and the oil tank, things that have caps attached have been redone. I didn't mention this earlier, but the caps are automatically welded all of the time now. And they changed the segment default count, so keep that in mind when you're using it. But the caps, if you make it editable, are definitely welded all the way. So that's nice. That's a, that's a, that's a positive. So if we were to make a new material here, let's go ahead into the color channel and just throw in a nice simple checkerboard. We can go ahead and throw that on the cylinder and we're gonna see some nice clean UVWs. And that is going to go across the board on a bunch of objects, even going all the way up to the new text. If we drop UV or drop the tag on there, you can see we got a really nice cap projection here, but it goes all the way over to these fancy rounding and even all the step and solid, all the different types. They have really nice UVs that travel all the way up and down them. But there's been a couple of tweaks in the uh, UV editing in Cinema as well. So let's go ahead and jump to this file. I've got that mouse character again. I've already kind of done a couple of setups here with the uh, edge tool, just getting some outlines going. So if we were to jump into the body paint UV edit layout, then it's going to pop open here. And the workflow actually for getting some decent UVs in Cinema, I don't think is terribly difficult. If you go and you look at your character, go to the projection tab. I'm going to click frontal. You can see it's just projected in frontal. That just makes sure all of your UVs are connected with each other the way that they would be normally in your scene. We can jump into the Relax UV. I'm going to change it to LSCM or ABF, whichever works better. I usually try both. And make sure your cut selected edges is turned on. And then I'll, all I have to do is hit Apply. And it's going to chop him up into little bits. And we can also try LSCM, see if that looks any better. They look pretty similar to me. So I'm going to hit that. And actually, there's an auto realign button I always forget about. But if you turn that on, you can definitely see them lay out a lot better. And there we go. We've got a nice layout. Let's try LSEM. Also good. Uh, I don't even specifically see a strong preference for one or the other. But uh, some of these tools have been cleaned up a little bit. If you go to any of your UV tools, go to the UV polygon. I'm going to select just one of these. Let's grab that one. UW, select all of the currently so, you know, select connected. And then we can click on the newly updated UV transform tool. And you can see we get this nice new little gizmo here where we can move it around. We can spin it around. We can grab an edge and scale it. We can hold down shift and scale it left and right. Hold down control or command. And let me see, grab a point in the corner. And you can see we can do a nice little shear on it. You can also grab a corner point, scale it up and down, hold down shift. And you can do a non-uniform scale, hold down control and get a free form transformation on it. And of course, you can do, start doing things like holding down Alt and getting the opposite corner or Shift and getting identical corners. You can see we can really go and distort this thing around and get some, um, some crazy layouts on it if we want to. So that's a nice little useful tool to be manipulating UVs some more in Cinema 4D. There are a couple more things in this version of Cinema that I am not very qualified to talk about for a couple of reasons. But let's see if we can do a little hint, at least talk about them being here. Let's go ahead and change our layout, jump here. And first of all is there is a new rig type inside of the character creation tool. So inside of character, you can do some auto rigging and there's a new one. Let me see what we got here. Uh, there's a new mode for a Mixamo control rig where you're supposed to be able to rig your character up pretty seamlessly here, just like you usually do with the character rigging tool. And then you can bring in a Mixamo animation and just have them link. I tried doing it and I don't have any access to documentation. I wasn't able to figure out by myself. So my result was something like this, which is fairly terrifying. Laying everything, I don't know. There's something I did wrong and it's my fault. So I'm pretty sure it's going to be a pretty cool tool. I just don't have it. The other tool I'm not overly qualified to attempt to talk about is the new auto waiting. And I just haven't tinkered that much. And if I haven't been able to read the documentation, it, there's just not going to be that much I can do. But there are two new types of auto waiting where there's like a heat map and a volume based one. And they seem to do a much better job of getting around corners and being smoother and whatnot. I'm really excited to look into them, but they'll have to be completely separate tutorials on doing those at some point. And maybe on, if I can pull off the live stream, maybe I'll be able to talk about those more on the live stream proper. So I sadly do not have any visuals to go along with this last part, but I thought it'd be important to mention. And the reason I don't is all the next stuff is involving using the node-based materials and using ProRender, neither of which I use. Mostly because right now the node-based materials are not tied into the displacer or the shader effect or anything that you could kind of build that way. 
and typically I don't do much rendering. And when I do do some rendering, I've been trying to get more into Redshift because Maxon acquired them. Having said that, I wanted to mention some of these nodes because they seem really cool and some of the other details. First of all, they're adding in node spaces, and the idea of this is they're opening up the Material Node API for all the third-party developers. So that means that Redshift and Arnold, Octane, all of them can go and tie in to the same universal system. And ultimately, a user or somebody could make a material where the controls are simultaneously controlling the equivalent material in Arnold or Octane or Physical, and you could somewhat interchangeably jump between them. There's potential for that to be built, but it's going to take a while for the third-party developers to do that, and someone would have to make those materials. But it's a cool option. In addition to that, there are a bunch of really cool new just shaders and nodes inside of the material nodes. And if I was using the node materials at all, I'd be really, really excited for these. I'm kind of excited in general for them. I just need them to be implemented in a way that's going to mean something to me. So the first is that they're adding in a blur node. I've really wanted a blur for a really long time. Once you add in blur, there's a lot you can do with it. And I did do a quick test where the blur did work even on top of a noise. And that's really exciting, the idea of blurring something and recombining it in other ways. Like, it's a workflow I really love. They're adding in a cache node, much in the way that it was working with the volume, so you can kind of cache something to, so it doesn't have to calculate all the way through. There's also a new kernel node. Not that I know, I don't know much about it, but there's a bunch of presets where you can do things like box blur and edge detection, embossing and sharpening. Uh, haven't personally gotten to tinker with that one, but it sounds neat. There's a new generator that generates cells, which is kind of like a Voronoi breaking apart, but it's based on a material and the way the material is spread out. So if you fed a gradient, you're going to get more cells in one spot than another. And, it, oh man, if you could feed that out into like a displacer or something, that'd be really, really cool. So I'm looking forward to hopefully that being the case one day. Uh, next up, they added in some round corners. It's kind of the classic shader where you can put that on a box and it makes the corners look beveled. And it's just really neat that you can do that via shaders. Uh, it seems like there's some combination of things where you can make frosted glass now. It's almost like different roughnesses of glass inside of cinema in both physical and pro render, it seems. And then finally, they added in a line. It's just a straight up line. But from some of the imagery I saw, it was really cool. It was broken apart. And I'd love to go and tinker with that and maybe make a tutorial on that in the future. I just don't have that right now. The other important thing to note, once again, something I don't tinker around with too much, but it seems like if you're using node-based materials, then there are AOVs now. And I know a lot of people really love AOVs. If you're going and compositing with something else, those are you know, the ultimate thing for having ultimate control over what you were creating there. And if you don't know what an AOV is, it stands for Arbitrary Output Variable. The basic idea being is you can take a shader or part of a shader or part of the output of a particular material and render that out as a separate render pass so you could tweak that later. So, you know, you can imagine there'd be a racing stripe on a car and then you could change the color of that in post type of thing. But kind of anything that you could imagine you could pipe out into that. So that's really powerful. You've made it to the end. Thank you for watching. If you liked this breakdown, then a thumbs up or a comment below is always appreciated. This wasn't, I didn't have access to the documentation and I was trying to figure out a lot of this on my own. I was having a little bit of help with some people answering questions for me, but it's some tricky stuff and I really look forward to digging in deeper in the future. The new version of Cinema 4D is always a really exciting time for me. I really love all the features and some of the stuff in Cinema 4D is getting pretty deep. This field flow stuff is, is it's tricky to get my mind wrapped around, but it's so powerful. It's so crazy that these systems are getting integrated in those ways and breathing new life into old systems. It, it's really exciting. So I hope to do a live stream tomorrow if you're watching this video on the day it came out from live from SIGGRAPH and hopefully someone from Maxon will be joining me and will be able to break down a couple of the parts that I wasn't able to make a scene file that I was excited enough to show you. But in any case, that's going to be really cool. If you have any comments, if you have any uh, things that you'd like to see in the future tutorial wise or during a live stream, go ahead and leave a comment. This was really fun. I really enjoy breaking the stuff down, learning all the new features and trying to break down what I thought was important. I didn't hit absolutely everything that was new. There's a couple little things, but I think I hit all the big ones. At least I would mention them. And we're going to be able to go really deep on some of it. This definitely isn't a tutorial. It's just a breakdown. So you can expect a bunch of stuff about field flow from me and probably from Maxon. So go ahead and take a look on that. And anything I didn't cover, you probably just go to maxon.net and they're going to have some videos breaking down certain things. But this was kind of a, hopefully a little bit of a comprehensive breakdown in order of things that I thought was cool. So in any case, I will see you in another video or live stream soon. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.
another another 